Let's start with uh, a word of prayer and just ask the Lord's help as we open his word. Heavenly Father, we do just come before you and thank you for your care for us. God, you are a good Heavenly Father, and you have given us everything we need, I think especially of your word that you have given to us, that equips us for everything we need every day, for hope, for joy, for correction, for training in righteousness, for encouragement. Lord, you know how to equip your saints. And I'm so thankful that we have this word. God, it would not be worth standing up here uh, if it wasn't for your authoritative word to guide me, to guide us. So God, thank you. God, as we look to deal with a very particular sin, sensuality this morning, I just pray for your help. I pray for your protection of us. God, it's so easy to fall into a side of legalism and self-determination and trying to fight sin on our own and thinking that our uh, fighting sin has something to do with our right standing before you, and God, it doesn't. God, thank you that you have provided everything we need in your son, Jesus. Jesus, your son, who gives us everything we need for life and godliness. And God, on the other hand, I do not want us to take sin lightly, as if it doesn't matter, as if your grace is a freedom to sin. Oh God, protect us from that as well. Help us to find the narrow road where we trust you and persevere and make it to your kingdom. God, these are big requests, and we need you. We need your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, help us this morning as we open your word and think about how to fight sin, specifically the sin of sensuality, rightly. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever thought about God being happy? Have you thought about God's happiness? God is happy, unshakably so. He is perfectly at peace. He is perfectly in control, perfectly good, and and far from needing a source or supply of good things. He is the source and supply of all good and pleasurable things. And this is one of the many reasons that God can sit in the heavens, sit on his throne, perfectly at peace, and he can laugh when nations shake their fists at him and try to do everything they can to dishonor him, to destroy him. He is at peace. And I don't want to minimize God's sorrow over sin, his anger at sin, or his immense compassion for sinners. But we must know this, that God is happy. And if we want to be happy, we have to know that God is the source of all happiness. And and I get this from Ephesians 1 verse 3. And I'm going to read it. You can listen. And I just want you to notice the three times that Paul uses the word blessed. And, And I think that's a great translation, blessed. Happy is a little, can sound frivolous, especially in English. But the, the base of blessedness is this sense of profound happiness, profound satisfaction, a profound sense of having everything he needs in himself. So here we go. This is Ephesians 1 verse 3. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So God is happy. And he is the source of all happiness, the source of all true happiness, spiritual blessing, as opposed to just physical temporal blessings. These are lasting blessings. And he blesses us who are in Christ. So everyone who is in Christ that is chosen by God, redeemed by God, given an inheritance by God, sealed, protected by God, those people are blessed. Truly blessed, their happiness runs deeper than the things of earth. So what is it 
Just take a self-evaluation really quick. What is it that you think is going to make you happy? Where do you go to find peace, stability, goodness, pleasure, all those things that are generally required for a state of happiness, state of blessedness? What circumstances do you put your stamp of hashtag blessed on? What are they for you? All idols and sin, all of them, love to masquerade as sources of happiness. And today we're not going to unmask sin in general, but one sin in particular. And that is the sin of sensuality. Sensuality, we're going to find, is a failed attempt at happiness. It's a permissiveness to find happiness through what pleases us, and it's a lie. It's defiling, it's destructive, it's deceiving, and it must be defeated. So why, why just sensuality? Why have I picked that as the sin to unmask this morning? Um, the reason for me is mostly autobiographical. Uh, I've read my Bible, listened to sermons for most of my life. I've I've definitely heard the term sensuality. I've read it as I've gone through my Bible. Uh, But I've never really considered what it meant. It just is often in a list of a lot of other things. And uh, I guess I always assumed it was just another term for sexual immorality. Uh, But I never considered that while all sexual immorality is sensuality, sensuality is actually a little bit broader. Not all sensuality is sexual. And I hadn't considered this until I was here last furlough, and John Anderson was preaching through Mark chapter 7. And in Mark 7, verses 21 to 23, Jesus is explaining those sins that arise out of the human heart and defile a person. And number nine on that list, on Jesus' list, was sensuality. And here's how John described sensuality that morning. He said it is ultimately a lack of self-constraint, a removal of restraints. It's doing what pleases the senses. And when he said that, it, he opened a window for me to see areas where I was still self-pleasing, self-serving, though I was and still am actively putting lust to death. I realized that I was not even in the battle against some other pleasures, some other ways in which I was pleasing myself without self-control. Pleasing myself with, with treats, with comforts, with entertainment, with leisure, allowing love for the world, the things in the world, and its pleasures to crowd out my love for God and my Savior. It was an eye-opening sermon for me, and it was an invitation to, to join this fight. As believers, when, when sin is uncovered, when the Lord uh, opens a door for us to see areas of sin in our lives, it's an invitation to go to battle. And what I want to do this morning is really just uh, show you guys how I am fighting this battle. Uh, I've heard it said that we... We teach best what we need to learn most. Um, So know that as I speak about sensuality, what it is, how to slay it, the person I am thinking about most is myself. I need to keep learning these things. And I, I think this is a great topic for equipping hour because I do hope that this message will equip you, will equip us to see sensuality for what it is and to slay it where it stands. I want us to see the great deception of sensuality. I want us to be free of it. I want us to really know the happiness, the blessedness of God. The happiness, the holiness, the inheritance that is ours in Christ. So the the Greek word often translated sensuality or licentiousness or wantonness or lustful desire, depending on your translation, uh, it's used only 10 times in the New Testament. Uh, And we're going to let those passages help us understand some things about sensuality. I'm not sure we'll look at all of them this morning. Uh, I do touch on quite a few of them. Uh, We're going to look at sensuality. We're going to look at its definition. What is it? Followed by its dangers, 
Why should we slay it? Uh, And finally, we'll look at the defeat of sensuality. How do we go about killing it? So let's start with the definition. And I'm going to start by giving you my definition of sensuality, and then I'll show you how I got it. So here's my definition. Sensuality is slavery to the desires of the body rather than submission to God and his word. Sensuality is slavery to the desires of the body. So what the body wants, the body gets, rather than obedience to God and his word. So it's a denial of God's authority. It says God has no right to put limitations on our desires. And there are two elements to this definition. Sensuality is a love of pleasure. That's one aspect of it. Sensuality is a love of pleasure coupled with a denial of God's authority. Sensuality is pleasure pursuing, pleasure obeying, pleasure enjoying, rather than God pursuing, God obeying, God enjoying. Now let's, let's read a few places where this word sensuality shows up so you can see if that definition rings true or not. This word often appears in lists of sins and vices. So if you look up that word sensuality, if you look up some of those passages, you'll see it's in a lot of lists. Lists are really helpful for categorizing sins, knowing where they belong. But it's not so helpful for defining those sins. Uh, But there are three passages in the New Testament that I could find where sensuality is discussed in more helpful detail. Uh, One of those is Ephesians 4. So if you have your Bible and you want to turn there with me, we're going to look at Ephesians 4, verse 17 to 19. Ephesians 4, 17 to 19. Now this... I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding. They're alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So here, Paul is writing to the Ephesians, and he's saying that the Gentiles, that's the nations, in relation to God, they have, this is what defines their relationship to God. He says, futility of mind, ignorance, darkness, a callousness, an unfeelingness of conscience. That's their relationship to God. So in other words, not a very healthy relationship to God. In relation to practicing wrong, practicing unclean deeds, they have given themselves over to sensuality and greediness. They have allowed themselves to indulge. They have given themselves license. They've let themselves become the boss to determine what they will or will not do. They have given themselves over to their appetites. And this freedom is not just for some impure deeds. Notice it says, Unclean deeds of every kind, all of them. Every kind of unclean deed. And not just once, mind you. They want more and more and more. In greediness, Paul wrote. In greediness. So disregard for God has led to them giving themselves over to sensuality, which leads to impurity, all of it and lots of it. So what is sensuality here? I, I think it, here it's, it, it is the step between having become callous and the practicing of every kind of impurity and lots of it. There is something that happens between the rejection of God and the habitual practice of sinning. And I think it, here it's this giving oneself over to a freedom to sin. It's letting one's desires become the driving force for action, the decisive voice in what's right or wrong. It's the letting our desires and our perceptions become king. We don't want God on the throne anymore to tell us what to do. We want to do what we want, when we want. That's sensuality. Let's look at another passage. 
This is perhaps the most helpful for understanding sensuality. Uh, it's Second Peter chapter 2. Uh, it's really helpful because sensuality is used three times in one chapter. It's the most dense use of that word uh, in the Bible. Second Peter chapter 2. Let's start by looking at verses 1 and 2 together. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. But false prophets arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many who follow their sensuality, many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. So Peter writes that in the church, there are going to be, at times, false teachers. People who are going to teach heresies, lies. They're going to deny the master who bought them. They're going to deny Jesus Christ. They become a law unto themselves. Jesus is no longer the boss. He is no longer Lord. They claim freedom to do what they please. Maybe they'll say things like, God just wants you to be happy. So pursue your pleasures. You have God's approval. He won't judge you. Things like that. And that kind of teaching, unfortunately, attracts a following. Look at verse 2. Many will follow them. It's popular. And what do their followers do? They do the exact same thing. And here's where our word is used. They follow the sensuality of the false teachers. They follow that practice. They too disregard the truth and God's authority. Because of them, the truth is maligned. It gets a bad name because they're not following the truth. They're, they too are false. They've got false motives, false words. And notice that this crowd, that is the teachers and those who follow them, they are only looking out for their own desires. When they come teaching, when they come speaking to you, they are exploiting you. Did you see that? They exploit. They really don't love their audience. They don't love their audience. They're greedy. It's actually in greed. Same expression we saw in Ephesians 4. There's a greediness, an insatiableness, a more and moreness to this sin. And the examples that Peter uses in this chapter in 2 Peter 2. The examples that Peter uses to illustrate such sensuality and its consequences are the flood account and the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, where freedom to sin led to gross perversions, rampant sexual immorality, and wanton violence. The word sensuality, uh, there, there's not really a Hebrew equivalent. That word doesn't really appear in the Old Testament. But here, Peter is saying the reality of sensuality is all over the place. And he points specifically to the flood in Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, in the flood account in Genesis 6, it's actually demons who leave their bounds and cohabitate with women, producing a large, destructive, violent group of men. And Sodom and Gomorrah were likewise lawless. They were given over to sensuality. They were a law unto themselves. Their passions and desires were supreme. Those were the boss, their appetites. It was so bad that when visitors came to their town, instead of being hospitable and caring for them, protecting them, they were to be used for the pleasure of the crowd. All restraint had been thrown aside Sensuality is slavery to the desires of the body rather than slavery to God. It's obedience to the desires of the body rather than obedience to God. And here's Peter's final word on these sensuous false teachers. If God punished without mercy angels and men yet preserved Noah, and if God condemned Sodom and Gomorrah to fiery destruction and yet rescued Lot, then look at the concluding word in 2 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. 2 Peter 2, 9 and 10, concluding word. If God has done all that, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials 
and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those, here it is, who indulge in the lust of defiling passion in sensuality and despise authority. Those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. So there it is. There's the two defiling aspects of sensuality. Indulging the flesh and despising authority. Jude writes something similar. Uh, You can look briefly if you want over at Jude, just a few books to the right. Look at Jude uh, chapter, or chapter, chapter one, verse four. Jude verse four. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turned the grace of God into licentiousness. That's what the NASB says. If you have the ESV, it'll say sensuality. I think LSB too translates that word the same throughout sensuality and denies our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So three times now we've seen the link between denial of God's authority and the abuse of God's gifts. God's marvelous grace in Jude 4 here, God's marvelous grace is twisted to mean freedom to sin, freedom to pursue pleasure. Personal pleasure becomes the goal of salvation. God saved us so we can please ourselves. In other words, what what these false teachers are saying is God is gracious and forgiving to free us up to do whatever we find most pleasing at any given moment. That's the message of sensuality. Sensuality sees self-gratification as the chief end of man. God and his word are often belittled, twisted, or ignored altogether, and his gifts are put in his place. Sensuality is the practice of giving oneself freedom, license to pursue one's appetites, whatever the body desires. It's the removal of restraint, the absence of personal discipline. A sensual person, instead of controlling the body, is controlled by the body. It's a love of self rather than a love of God. And I, I hope that you see here that there is a difference between receiving God's good gifts with thankfulness and pursuing God's good gifts without regard for God. There is a difference. There are pleasures that God has given us to enjoy. And and I hope this definition helps us see there is a way to enjoy the gifts that God gives. There is a way to enjoy the pleasures that he gives. And it's with submission to him, obeying him, thanking him for every good gift, thanking him for every trial when those good gifts are removed. That is the way to enjoy good gifts. What we want to avoid is this rejection of God's authority, this saying God has no right to speak into these areas of my life and I'm free to enjoy these things apart from him. If that is going on in any flavor in your heart like it is in mine, it's sensuality and it needs to die. It needs to die, but why? That's our next question. Why is sensuality so dangerous. So let's move from the definition to the dangers. The dangers of sensuality. What's, what's the big deal? So what if we give ourselves pleasure from time to time? Don't we have freedom in Christ to live a little? Doesn't God want us to be happy? And if health and wealth and all the pleasures that come from those things make us happy, why should we kill that which is sensual in our hearts and minds? What about learning to love ourselves a little more? All those questions represent a kind of thinking that is so pervasive in our day. Probably every day in human history, but we get to see it in our day. It's it's so common. What about us? What about our pleasures? What about loving myself more? Isn't that healthy? Isn't that good for me? Well, let's let... God's words speak to those questions. When we, when we think of sins as little or inconsequential, I think what we're going to find is it's because we're thinking little of God 
and thinking of him as being inconsequential to our day, to our lives. Just consider the following array of scripture. And I'm going to read these quickly. You don't have to follow along. Um, I've shortened these verses a bit to focus on the sensuality theme in each. Just listen to this array of scripture and see what it says about the danger of sensuality. You ready? I'm going to start with Mark 7, 21 to 23. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceeds sensuality. And this evil proceeds from within and defiles the man. Galatians 5, 19 through 20. Now the deeds of the flesh, sensuality, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice sensuality will not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Peter 4, 3 to 5. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out sensuality. In this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Friends, sensuality is dangerous because it is eternally destructive. If God is not your master, if you deny God as your master, as your authority, then God will be your judge. He will. This makes sensuality more serious than the worst natural disaster. We should dread this more than earthquakes. This is more dangerous than the most terminal forms of cancer, the deadliest weapons in the hands of the cruelest people. They, those things can merely kill your body. That's all they can do. But sensuality makes you guilty, makes you defiled, makes you dirty, makes you impure before the judge of the universe. And he has the right to cast body and soul into hell forever. In judgment forever. Never to find forgiveness. Never to gain a second chance. Never to have one moment's rest or one drop of water. I don't think it surprises us, many of us, when we open our Bibles and find out that murder and adultery are punishable by hell. But I think many people, probably not here, but many people in the world are surprised to hear from the lips of Jesus that the cares of this world and the desire for other things can choke the word and cause people to leave the living God. John Piper, in a in a book uh, he wrote, A Hunger for God, wrote this. For all the ill that Satan can do, when God describes what keeps us from the banquet table of his love, from the kingdom, you know what it is? It's a piece of land, a yoke of oxen, and a wife. Luke 14, 18 to 20. Still quoting Piper, the most deadly appetites are not for the poison of evil, but for the simple pleasures of earth. For when these replace an appetite for God himself, the idolatry is scarcely recognizable and almost incurable. And I would add to that quote, scarcely recognizable, almost incurable, and remarkably deadly. Sensuality is worth slaying on that basis alone. But let me expand the danger of sensuality a little bit more. Not only is it eternally destructive, but it's also universally pervasive. It's a pandemic that affects every continent, all people, every tribe, every tongue, every nation. And it's pervasive not because it's contagious, but because it springs up within the heart of all mankind. It comes from the heart. Remember what Jesus said in Mark 7, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceeds sensuality. So it's a heart problem, and therefore it should come as no surprise that sensuality is everywhere. Galatians 5, 19 through 21 says this, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. 
Sensuality is one of the things that Paul calls the deeds of the flesh. That means it comes naturally to us, comes naturally to our bodies, naturally to the way we think and we feel and we act. To pursue pleasure apart from God is common. So not only is it deadly, it's not rare, it's not out there somewhere where you can point, oh yeah, it's those heathens out there who are sensual, who are pursuing pleasures. That that is true, they are doing that, but it's also in here. It's in this room. It's in the heart of the person speaking to you. It is pervasive. Sensuality is not rare. No more rare than immorality, jealousy, conflict, anger, drunkenness, the other things on that list It's common. We can look out in the world and see so many who have given themselves over to do whatever they please. It's a universal problem. And Paul wrote in Ephesians 4 that the Gentiles, the nations, walk contrary to the Lord and give themselves over to sensuality. And Peter, in his first letter, calls sensuality the desire of the nations. For the time, this is 1 Peter 4, verse 3, for the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the nations, the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, carousing, drinking parties, abominable idolatries. It's common. J.C. Ryle in that little book, How Readest Thou, wrote this. The discoveries of travelers around the world never convict the Bible of mistakes. Are the distant islands of the Pacific laid open? Nothing is found that is in the slightest degree contradictory to Bible, the Bible's account of man's heart. When, when we went to Papua New Guinea and moved into our little village, super remote in the middle of nowhere in the mountains, if there was ever a chance to find a people group who is untouched by the evils of the West— and is just thriving and doing well and has, uh, is doing things that please the Lord, that would be the place to find it. And you know what you find? You find sensual people. Sensuality, this rejecting of God and indulging the appetites, it plagues the mountains of Papua New Guinea. And when I cross the ocean and go translate and preach the word there, I don't leave my sensuality behind in America. It goes with me. Sensuality is a real problem. It's pervasive and deadly. So now we know what it is, the definition of sensuality. We know why we should kill it. That's the dangers. Let's finish up with how to kill it. The defeat of sensuality. How do we defeat this, this sin? How do we defeat sensuality? How do we defeat this slavery to our appetites, slavery to the desires of the body, and this rejection of God and his authority? Number one, I think we need to remember, first and foremost, that sensuality has already been defeated for every believer in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Isn't it nice? You're called to slay sensuality. You're called to put this sin to death. And it has already been put to death, ultimately, for you. We've looked at Galatians 5, 19 through 21 briefly already, but but let's turn there again. Galatians 5, we'll spend a few moments here. Galatians 5, starting in verse 19. Galatians is helpful because it's a whole book written to people who had turned to human means to make themselves right before God. Human means of dealing with sensuality have to be left in the gutter as completely worthless. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you solutions, give you strategies, but if you only take those strategies and neglect the help that comes from Jesus Christ, then you will be hopeless in your battle against sensuality. Man-made solutions and our own resolve to change are powerless when facing an enemy like sensuality. So let's look again at the bad news that Paul starts with in Galatians 5, 
19 through 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. They're obvious. Here's what they are. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you now, just as I have forewarned you before, that those who practice such things, including sensuality, will not inherit the kingdom of God. So those are the deeds of the flesh. Those who practice those deeds will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the bad news that we looked at earlier. But do you know what follows this list of the deeds of the flesh? It's a list of the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 22. But, contrary to that, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So here's, here's the good fruit. Now, the question is, how do you get it? How do you get from being a part of the list of the deeds of the flesh and then you look at this other list that seems so wonderful and you think, how do I get from there to there? How do I get from walking by the flesh, walking in my own strength, doing all of these vile things which disqualify me from the kingdom? How do I get from there to this list, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? How do I get there? Look at verse 24. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Trusting in Jesus Christ unites us with him in his death and his death for us is also a death in us regarding our passions and desires. Earlier in Galatians, in chapter 2, verse 20, Paul wrote of himself, I have been crucified with Christ And it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Do we we believe God and his word? Are we trusting him? Do we live by faith in the Son of God, what Jesus Christ did on our behalf? Do we know that God loves us and gave himself up for us? We might look at sensuality in our own lives and either feel discouraged and resign ourselves over to our sensuality, just make peace with it because that's easier. Or worse, we might feel confident and charge ahead thinking we can take out sensuality within us with some just good old-fashioned self-discipline, pulling up our bootstraps, and make war on our sensuality without the aid of God and his Spirit. And sensuality is too strong an enemy to face that way. The debt of guilt is too great for us to pay. We need help. And there is help. Sensuality is not too difficult for God to overcome. He overcame it by sending his son. And the debt that our sensuality has accrued, that debt that we have for every time we have ever been sensual, that we have ever pursued our appetites ignoring God, deciding to pursue that over him. We have been defiled. We have accrued debt and it was paid in full by the blood of Jesus if you trust him. And the strength and the wisdom to grow in holiness, when you you trust in the Lord Jesus, when you are in Christ, when you are found in him, when you're trusting in him, when you've asked him for help, Right? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, everyone who says, God, help me, have mercy on me, a sinner, that person goes home justified. That person gets the help they need. That person gets the Holy Spirit to provide them with the strength and wisdom to grow in holiness. Robert Murray McShane said, for every look at self, every time you look at your sensuality, take 10 looks to Christ And Peter wrote, Christ has the life and the godliness that we so desperately need. Everything that pertains to life and godliness, it's in Christ. So if you find yourself, if you, if you go this week and try to have self-control in areas where you haven't before, and you find yourself powerless, it may mean that you are not saved. It may mean you don't have the Holy Spirit. 
And when you find that out, when, when you try to defeat sensuality, when you try to have self-control and you just can't, you find out, I'm a slave to my appetites. What you don't do is pull up your bootstraps and say, I'm going to go after it harder. No, you go back to Christ. You go, oh, I need the help that God speaks of in his word. So first, remember Christ. Remember that he has already defeated sensuality on your behalf and frees you up to fight it. Secondly, press on to know the Lord. Uh, one thing I love about um, Peter in, in Second Peter, in his second letter, is how often he speaks to his readers about knowing the Lord. So in, in chapter 2, he's going to warn them about false prophets, false teachers, those who are going to follow their teaching, follow that sensuality. But in the first chapter, to equip them to, to beware the, those dangers, he mentions knowing the Lord multiple times. Uh, let me see if I can find them. I didn't put it in my notes, but I'll just look real quick. In verse 2, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. In verse 3, his divine power is granted to us everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who calls us to his own glory and excellence. In verse 5 and 6, he talks about supplementing our faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control. In verse 8, Uh, If these qualities are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 12, you've got, Therefore I intend always to remind you of these things that you know, uh, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. So they know them, there's knowledge, and Peter just wants to remind them again. Remind them again. Put truth in front of them again. And then, of course, in verses 16 through 21 of 2 Peter 1, we have him pointing people back to the word, back to the word. We need to not only remember our Savior, but we need to grow in our knowledge of God. We need to fear him more, know him more, trust him more. A.W. Tozer in his book, Knowledge of the Holy, wrote, It's impossible to keep our moral practices sound and our inward attitudes right when our idea of God is erroneous or inadequate. We need to know God more. Wrong views of God lead to wrong views of people, which leads to wrong ideas about what our greatest problem actually is, which leads to false gospels, which offer lesser solutions to lesser problems. We have to beware that downfall. Solution? know more about God. We need to see our greatest needs and we need to look to Christ as our greatest savior. The more we know of God, the more we trust in facts about him, truth about his greatness, his character, his promises, the more we will grow in holiness. Don't arm yourself simply with virtue or self-discipline. Arm yourself with truth. Peter, at the end of chapter one of Second Peter, writes, pay attention to the prophetic word as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Pay attention to it. The world is dark. God's word is light. Pay attention to this. Know more of God and who he is. As you believe the gospel, as you trust the Lord in prayer and seek the Lord in his word and grow in your knowledge of him, you're ready for strategy number three, which is discipline the body. Discipline the body. Slay sensuality. If sensuality is obedience to the desires of the body, slavery to the desires of the body, rather than obedience to God and his word, well then don't do that. Stop it. If you're taking notes, it's S-T-O-P-I-T. And it's amazing how that, is, that really is the logic of the epistles so often. It's Paul starts off with grand, wonderful explanations, not of what you do, but of what God has done. 
gives you the gospel, tells you this is all the things that God has done on your behalf. All of it before you were born. He has done all of these things. He has saved you, not based on your works. He chose you before the foundation of the world. He gave you ears to hear the gospel. He brought someone to share the gospel with you. He opened your heart to receive it. He did all those things. He did all those things. And then usually you get halfway through Paul's letters. And then he says, so now, stop it. Now walk in a manner worthy of that good news. God has already done everything. You are now free to obey him. Make every effort to submit to God's authority. If sensuality is a rejection of God's authority, make every effort. Make every effort to submit to God's authority. Make your body your slave. Don't make the demands of your body your highest priority. Make obeying God and his word your highest priority. In Christ, you have been freed up to do that. I'm reading a really helpful book right now on leadership by John MacArthur called Called to Lead. Uh, And in there, there's a whole chapter describing how not to be disqualified as a leader. And in that In that chapter, he points out how Paul, now think about Paul for a second. Paul was commissioned by the risen Christ, had an actual meeting with the risen Christ, and was sent to be the apostle to the Gentiles, and he wrote a significant portion of the New Testament. So he was carried along by the Holy Spirit and wrote words from God himself. That's Paul, okay? And MacArthur pointed out that That Paul, who all those things are true about, was carried along by the Holy Spirit and wrote these words in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. And you you probably know these words. I'll read them for you. This is what Paul wrote. I discipline my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Paul who had a commissioning from Jesus Christ himself did not want to be disqualified and disciplined himself to finish the race well. MacArthur comments, most people are controlled by their bodies. Their bodies tell their minds what to do. Feed me more. Don't overwork me. Give me pleasure. Give me rest. That is why the sin principle is called the flesh throughout the Pauline epistles. So, Paul says, we need to put to death the deeds of the body. One of the solutions that MacArthur puts forward to help us kill the deeds of the flesh um, is to say no to ourselves from time to time. He just gave a whole list of really practical ways to um, not be disqualified. And one one of the things he mentioned was say no to yourself from time to time. Learn to say no. He writes, gain control of your own appetites by denying yourself pleasures that you may be entitled to. That sort of self-denial is precisely what Paul was describing in 1 Corinthians 9.27. I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Growing up, I I remember my parents always describing self-control to me as the ability to say no to yourself. If if you have self-control, that means you actually have the ability to say no to yourself. And that would make self-control a near opposite to sensuality. Instead of obeying your desires, try disobeying them. Say no. Every now and then, this one's for me, say no to a cup of coffee in the morning. Or five cups as it may be. Say no. Say no to dessert. Say no to treating yourself. Say no to whatever entertainment you normally binge. Make your body your slave, not the other way around. So learn to say no to yourself from time to time. Not all those things are bad. Not all those things must be avoided all the time, like other sins in the Bible. We'll avoid the sin. But pleasures 
are not something that you need to avoid all the time. The question is, are you controlled by them? Practice saying no to yourself. Practice saying no. Here's another weapon for killing sensuality. So one is to say no to yourself from time to time. Here's another one to try. Try serving others. Serve others. Get your view off of yourself and what you want and serve others. This, this strategy actually makes the list, Jesus' top two list of the greatest commandments of all time. Do you know that? Love God, and the second is like it, love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Nothing kills self-service like serving others. When you say no to that entertainment, Maybe replace that with being hospitable. Welcome others into your home and care for them, body and soul. When you say no to treating yourself, maybe treat someone else. Do something for your spouse or your coworker or your little sister. Service requires sacrifice. Sacrifice requires suffering. And I guarantee your flesh hates to suffer. It's good for your flesh to suffer. You want to kill it? Practice serving others. But you know what's also true because God says it's true? It's more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed. There's more happiness in giving of yourself than in receiving. There's more happiness to be had in giving than getting, in serving others than serving self. In 2 Corinthians 4.17, Paul writes, temporary small sufferings which if you put to death sensuality, you're going to suffer. And those temporary small sufferings produce, here's what it's producing for you, weighty eternal glory. So we've we've come back full circle to happiness. I, I want to be happy and I want you to be happy. And we know from God's word that happiness is only found one place. When, when sensuality rears its ugly head and says, if you serve the appetites of your body, you'll be satisfied. Your flesh is lying to you. It wants to destroy you. It's exploiting you. And you are on the road to not inheriting the kingdom of God. That's serious. Put it to death. When it feels right to obey the desires of the body, then it just goes to show you're believing the lie. And that lie, at the end of the day, will kill you and make you profoundly unhappy. Oh, that we would come to the happiest of beings, the triune God, and trust him with our own happiness and put to death this liar called sensuality. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and how clear it is. God, I'm so thankful to have had this opportunity to study more sensuality, what it is, how to kill it. God, it's so helpful for me. I pray that you would grant me, your Holy Spirit, to have more self-control, to be able to say no to myself more, to discipline my body and make it my slave lest after having preached this sermon, I be disqualified. God, thank you for the fear of you and how healthy it is for wisdom and holy living. God, thank you for Jesus Christ and that we have great hope in the defeat of sensuality. God, I pray for my fellow brothers and sisters here who perhaps are having this door opened for the first time to see the dangers of sensuality in their own life. God, I pray that you would encourage them with truth from your word that this wicked enemy can be overcome, has been overcome, and we can grow in holiness in this area. Would you equip us well through your word and may we find many victories this week in our battle against sensuality. I ask this in your son's name. Amen.